you have your Bibles, let me go ahead and encourage you to turn with me to Daniel chapter 10. Today is going to be a, a jam-packed sermon on what Daniel is seeing in a vision and then also understanding how this vision that Daniel has and the message that Daniel is receives in this chapter actually affects you and I today. If you ask the average person, do they believe in angels, the average person would probably say yes, they believe in some type of angel. They might even say that they have a guardian angel. But today we're not going to be focusing on just having a guardian angel. We're going to be talking about the spiritual world of angels and demons. Uh, some of us might want to ignore the fact that there is angels and demons, but there is such a thing as angels and demons. In fact, the Bible says that there is an angelic conflict that goes on not only in the past, but also even right now today. We're going to see that even prayer sometimes is delayed because of a conflict of angels and demons. So if you have your Bibles, let's look together our foundation text it's going to come from the book of Daniel, chapter 10. Considering it only has just 21 verses, I'm going to read all of that to us this morning, and then we're going to just go right into the message. In the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, a message was received to Daniel, who was named Belshazzar. The message was true and was about a great conflict. He understood the message and had an understanding of the vision. And in those days, I, Daniel, was mourning for three full weeks. I did not eat any rich food, no meat, no wine entered my mouth, and I did not put any oil on my body until three weeks were over. On the 24th day of the first month, as I was standing on the bank of the great river, the Tigris, I looked up and there was a man dressed in linen with a belt of gold from ups and from his waist and his body was like topaz. His face was brilliance of lightning. His eyes were flaming torches. His arms and feet were like the glim of polished bronze. And the sound of his words like the sound of a multitude. Only I, Daniel, saw the vision. The men who were with me did not see it. But a great terror fell on them. And they ran and they hid. I was left alone looking at the great vision. No strength was left in me. My face grew deathly pale, and I was powerless. I heard the words of he that said, and when I heard them, I fell into a deep sleep, and with my face to the ground. Suddenly a hand touched me and raised me to my, to my hands and my knees, and he said to me, Daniel, you are a man treasured, by God. Understand the words that I am saying to you. Stand on your feet, for I have been sent to you. After he said this to me, I stood trembling. Do not be afraid, Daniel, he said to me, for from the first day that you purposed to understand and to humble yourself before your God, your prayers were heard. I have come because of your prayers." But the prince of the kingdom of Persia opposed me for 21 days. And then Michael, one of the chief princes, came and to help me after I had been left there with the kings of Persia. And now I have come to help you understand what will happen to your people and in the last days. For the vision refers to those days. And while he was saying these words to me, I turned my face towards the ground and was speechless. Suddenly one with human likeness touched my lips and I opened my mouth and said to the one standing in front of me, My Lord, because of the vision, anguish overwhelms me and I am powerless. How can someone like me, your servant, speak with someone like you, my Lord? And now I have no strength, and there is no breath in me. And then the one with human likeness touched me again and strengthened me. He said, Don't be afraid, you who are treasured by God. Peace to you. Be very strong. And as he spoke to me, I was strengthened and said, Let my Lord speak, for you have strengthened me. 
He said, Do you know why I have come to you? I must return at once to fight against the prince of Persia, and when I leave, the prince of Greece will come. No one has the courage to support me while against them except Michael, your prince. However, I will tell you what is recorded in the book of truth. May God bless the reading of His Word. Well, what we have here is two sections in chapter 10. One is that Daniel has received this great vision, and Daniel's troubled by the vision. He's also troubled because of what's actually happening during this time. The year is 536 B.C. During this time period, if you remember that the exiles from Israel... From Jerusalem, they have been brought into Babylon. They have been brought in there because of slavery. We know that the Babylonian Empire had invaded Jerusalem. They had ramshacked the temple. They destroyed their homes. And they brought these people. That's how Daniel gets to Babylon because he is one of those captives. And while Daniel is living there, Daniel's probably about 90 years old during this time period. And while Daniel is seeing this vision, Daniel knows his people are allowed to go back to their homeland. And going back, he finds this out. He finds out that they are all excited about going back. In fact, there was probably about 49,000 of them, history records, that went back. But then he finds out that something happens. They get back and they're all excited, but then when they get there and see how the temple is and their homes, then they say, well, you know what? Let's spend more time fixing our homes than we do fixing the temple. And so Daniel gets word of that. You might say, well, why didn't Daniel leave and go back to the homeland? Why did he stay in Babylon? Did he love Babylon so much? Understand, Daniel is an older man at this time. He's about 90 years old. The travel itself would have been very difficult. But also, I believe it's because God was not done with Daniel in Babylon. Uh, we should not look down on Daniel and say, Daniel, why didn't you go back with your people? If it had been God's will for Daniel to go back to that land, he would have gone back because we have seen Daniel faithful in all the little things and Daniel was faithful in the big things as well. So what we have here, the third year of King Cyrus, Daniel being 90 years old, he is prompted, we first find out, to pray. Because when he sees the stress that the people have done, they've gone in there, they're not focusing on God, they're focusing on himself. Daniel has a reason to pray. My first point this morning is to ask you this. Do you have a reason to pray? If you say, well, Pastor, I really don't, did you know God can give you a reason to pray? Sometimes we wonder why things happen the way they do. Well, maybe it's because the only time we ever talk to God is when we're in the valley that we're in. If our life was always mountaintop experiences, do you think you would stop and pray? Most of us wouldn't. Some would, yes, but most of us would not. Why? Because things were so good we forget about the goodness of God. When do you appreciate your health the most? It's sometimes when our health is gone. When do we appreciate our wealth the most? When our wealth is gone. When do you appreciate some people the most? When our loved ones are gone. And so here what we see is that he's prompted to pray. The reason why is because he has the reports, the people return to the land, they rebuild the temple, but they stop and they start going back building their homes. Secondly, we know there was a preparation. Daniel doesn't just jump into prayer, but he prepares himself for prayer. How does he do that? The Bible tells you how he does it. It says that Daniel fasted. What is fasting? That's something that's not preached on a lot. Fasting's the idea that you go without something, normally it's food, and take that time and focus in on the will of God while you're praying. Some of you might could fast breakfast, lunch, supper, or you want to fast all day. There's different kinds of fast. Maybe you're going to fast electronics. That, some of it would affect you more than fasting food. And the point is, is taking the time that you would normally spend and use that time in prayer and focus on God. You might say, well, Pastor, what if I get hungry? Trust me, if your focus is on God that moment, instead of eating, God will replenish you and you're going to be just A-OK. I promise you that. He fasted, but he also did what? He did not anoint himself. It's the idea, you say, well, what is the idea of an anointing? 
Well, how many of you, when you get up in the morning, you like to wash your face and put on deodorant and brush your teeth? You like to be refreshed. Well, Daniel says, I'm not even going to anoint myself. I'm not going to put anything on me because why? I'm so focused in on prayer, I'm even going to overlook the anointing of myself. And then you see the time. He doesn't just pray for a few minutes and say, Okay, Lord, it's all in your hands. It says he prayed for how long? Three weeks. Three weeks. My thought on that is, when's the last time that we've even spent three hours in prayer? Much less three weeks. You see, we know that his prayer is answered, but there is a delay to the answered prayer. Have you ever prayed and your prayers were delayed? I would imagine all of us have had prayers that God has answered immediately. At the very moment that it came off our lips, God was in the process of answering our prayers, even if the answer was no. But then there's been times in our life that when we pray, there's a delay. God, let this person be led to you. God, let this happen. God, please. And we pray this that His His will, but sometimes our prayers are delayed. Now the reason why this prayer is delayed, it says because in the Scripture it says that there is a battle between a heavenly force and also a demonic force. This battle is not being witnessed by the natural eye. And so that leads me to believe this. If God's Word does not change and God does not change, there is still a battle raging right now that our natural eye cannot see. You see, there is a spiritual warfare that's happening that if we were to peel back and look at the next level of what's happening around us, you would actually see angels and demons in conflict with one another. You might say, well, I wonder at times when I've been to certain worship services, there was such a cold, dead feeling in that service. Have you ever been to a worship service? You just thought to yourself, I- I'd have got just as much staying at home. Well, at that moment, it could have been that there was such a demonic spirit presence in that service that people's focus was not on God, but focused on themselves. You see, when we get so caught up in so many things that's other than God, then that is exactly what the enemy wants. Here what we see, though, is demonic presence that is being used and affecting God's people. Today we know, even in history of our modern time, that people have turned to spiritual forces for guidance. Uh, You might be amazed, and some of you are old enough, you know this already, But Ronald Reagan, his wife Nancy Reagan, if you would go and study his presidency, how she would consult with mediums and astrologers and have those come into the White House. And so Nancy Reagan, it says before she made any decision and would go talk to her husband, would have these fortune tellers come in and tell her what she should be doing. My friends, all that is is demonic in itself. We do not have to turn to fortune tellers. We do not have to turn to soothsayers to know the will of God. Simply we have to turn to the Bible. And so no matter if you think some world leader is great and the greatest thing in the world, if they are consulting with astrologers and witches, my friends, the only thing that is is demonic. You might say, well, what about in the rest of the world? Whenever Germany was defeated, we found out that when they go and they raided the bunkers of many of the German leaders, they found out that Adolf Hitler and some of the others that were such into dark magic, they were using the pagan occultic practices to guide them while they were exterminating the Jews. This is historical fact. And so even in our time whenever Hitler was here, that he says that many times he would get up to speak Those around him said he had such a power as if something took over his body when he spoke. He was such a great speaker that he could convince his people virtually anything. And those around him said that it was as if he was possessed. My friends, I will say to you, he was possessed. The possession was demonic. And here we see that. The idea is this, is that if we sit down and think it's all fun and games, like those people that play with Ouija boards... Boards that you sit there and try to get a spirit to speak to you. Understand this. If you take the devil to a dance, he's going to want to dance when his song is played. You're going to get that sometime, I hope. 
The idea is that if you're going to sit there and play footsies with the devil and don't think the devil is going to want to play footsies back, you are badly mistaken. The devil loves it when people think he's nothing more than a red character with horns and a pitchfork and a tail. The devil doesn't show up that way. The devil is a beautiful angel and the devil is a deceiver and a liar. If he showed up looking grotesque and horrible, if what he was doing looked that way, none of us would want it. But a demonic force, what it does, it makes what the world has to offer look so appealing. You think about the commercials they have trying to sell different alcoholic beverages. And no, it's not a sin, the Bible says, to drink alcohol. What the sin is to get drunk. And the reason why is when you're controlled by that spirit... It's because you're allowing a demonic force easy entry into you because your mind is not in control. Why do you think people do some of the things they do when they're drunk? It's because of the force of the demonics that are around them. Here we say in verse 12, look at verse 12. When Daniel's praying, one of the things that I love so much is that even though that there's this force of battle between good and evil and the angels that are raging around him, it says in verse 12 that this angel says, Do not be afraid, Daniel, for the first day that you purpose to understand and you humbled yourself before your God, your prayers were heard. So even though there is a demonic force of good and evil fighting, it says that God heard his prayers the very moment that Daniel conceived the prayer in his heart. Even when the prayer before it came off his lips, God knew the prayer that was inside of him. Folks, you don't have to get up and pray a loud prayer. You don't even have to pray an audible prayer for God to hear. Some of the most powerful prayers could be happening and no one even knows around you you're praying. So don't think, oh, I've got to get up in front of the church and pray. Well, that's good that we can do that. But know this, even if you're in a place that you can't call out on the Lord verbally, you can still call out on in your heart. How many of you have prayed in your heart for situations while you're going through something. You have prayed. I will let you know is the moment that prayer is entered the heart and the mind, God, it says in verse 12, heard the prayer. So even if you think God's not listening, He is listening. And God knows that we have weapons that can be used during our prayer life. What are those weapons? Our humility, as in Daniel. Our prayers, our knowledge and perseverance. God is using this so that we can have our prayers answered. You might say, well, here it says that, that, that this angel that was delayed for 21 days to get the prayer request fulfilled was doing battle, it said, against the kings of Persia. Notice that Daniel describes the demonic demons as kings of a region. The reason why is because demons cannot be all places at all times. Just like angels. Angels cannot be at all places at all times. The devil cannot be at all places at all times. So what has happened is that whenever there was a great battle in heaven, a third of the angels rebelled against God, and there was a great war that took place in heaven. And in that war, God and His angels, they won and they cast out the devil and the angels. And where did they go to? They went here on this earth. Satan, while being on this earth, assigned his demonic angels to different regions. You might wonder why there's so much spiritual conflict in certain parts of the world. The reason why is because certain demonic forces that are in those regions are stronger than other demonic forces. How do we know that? Because even the Bible says the kings of Persia, the kings of different areas, meaning these demonic forces, some of them are working without you even knowing it. Others are working and you see it because they are have invaded the life of that leader. So what do we learn about angels? Here's what we learn about angels and demons. If you're taking notes, I'm going to give you some Bible verses you can look up at a latter time. Angels have intelligence, but yet they don't know everything. In fact, we learn in Matthew 8, 29, 2 Corinthians 11, 3, 1 Peter 1.12, that angels know what's happening. 
But angels are not all-knowing. Now here's the thing. Angels <clears throat> have existed not from the beginning of time because they are created beings. God has created them. And these angels and the ones that have fallen, which we would call demons, that they have had an opportunity from the, from the time that they've been on this earth to observe how humanity works. Why is that important? Well, the devil has learned and the demonic forces have learned what humanity, what takes to get us to backslide or get us to sin. He's learned that. You say, well, how does he learn that? How many of you would admit this statement is true? It's just a different time, but we do sometimes the very same. We do the same thing as they did generations earlier. We never learn from our past. Well, these angels, these demons, see that what it took to influence someone. And so the demon said, well, look, I know that if I could tempt his granddaddy with alcohol and become a wife beater and become all these other things, I could tempt his father with that. And if it worked with his granddaddy, it worked with his daddy, sure enough, it's going to work with him. Have you ever wondered why there's generational curses on people where it seems like alcoholism or drugs or abuse or whatever it might be follows from one generation to the next? Have you ever thought of that? It's because these demons, forces, know exactly what it takes to influence that particular individual. I will let you know this first and foremost. I am a teetotaler when it comes to alcohol. The reason why... It's because my father's father, my grandfather on my father's side, was an alcoholic. My father was an alcoholic. So logic would say, if I start drinking, what would happen to me? Chances are, I would become what? An alcoholic. So a man that was a good man that was controlled by alcohol, the demonic forces knew that they could use that to change his whole persona. Imagine what would happen to me. My whole ministry would be destroyed because of something in a glass. So you ask yourself, why does it follow generation to generation? It follows into what? We are determined to break that generational bondage to that sin. Folks, will you be the one in your family to break the bondage of that demonic influence on your family? Divorce, I believe divorce is the same way. If you think about at the time that someone's granddaddy and mom, grandma divorced, then the parents divorced, then what happens to that next generation? They think how easy it is. Mama did it, grandma did it. First time you have an up, uh, upset argument, what do you do? You divorce. Folks, break that curse on your family. So what do we see? Angels have intelligence. You know, angels also have emotions. Luke chapter 2, verse 13. James chapter 2, verse 19. And Revelation chapter 12, verse 17. Emotions, just like you and I, angels and demons have emotions. Next, we learn that angels exercise will. They do what they will. Luke 8, 28 through 31, and the book of Jude, verse 6, 2 Timothy 2, 26. Angels are spirit beings, meaning they can travel, meaning that they can walk through walls, they can do different things. They're not limited to some of the physical properties. We know that from Hebrews 1, 14. Angels know the word of God and the nature of man. James 2, 19. Revelation 12, 12. So even angels know what the Word of God says. Why? Because the angels themselves, they know who Jesus is. The Bible says the devil even knows and trembles. He believes who Jesus is, but he doesn't accept Him as his Lord and Savior. So today if you leave here and you say, well, I believe Jesus is the Son of God, but I'm not going to accept Him. Well, you're no better than these demonic forces because they even know who Jesus is, but they will not accept who He is. Angels that are in heaven right now are praising God along with the saints. Psalm 148, verse 1 and 2. Angels in heaven right now are worshiping God. Revelation 5, 8 through 13. They are rejoicing in what God does. Job chapter 38, verse 6 and 7. Angels serve the will of God in Psalm 103, verse 20. And lastly, angels are the instrument 
of God's judgment. Revelation 7 verse 1. So in this type of spiritual battle, we learn that Paul says in Ephesians, very familiar passage, that we should do what? Put on the whole armor of God. So if you know that you're in a spiritual battle of angels and demons, the demonic forces, we should understand that we can have a helmet of salvation on, a breastplate of righteousness, that we can go into battle because of what our Savior has done for us. You see, we should understand that although demons and angels have power, they're not all powerful. So don't think to yourself, oh, I just can't do this because of the demonic forces or what's going on around me. My friends, your God and my God, our Savior Jesus Christ is more powerful than any demon out there. And when you feel like you're being oppressed by a demonic force and because a Christian cannot be possessed, if you're saved, the moment you're saved, the Holy Spirit dwells inside of you. And you cannot have the Holy Spirit living there and a demonic spirit living there either. Do you see, you only can have room for the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, or the Spirit that is an antichrist. So don't say, well, that person's a Christian, but yet they're filled with the devil. No, they're either one, being oppressed by Satan, or number two, they were never a Christian, and that's why they're demon-possessed. Now, do I believe in mental illness? Absolutely. I've been in enough ministry that I've seen mental illness firsthand. But do I believe in demonic possession? Yes, I do. I have seen that firsthand as well. I have been around people in areas that I knew for a fact were demon-possessed by the way they act, the way they talked, and you knew there was a demonic spirit there. I was in a nursing home many years ago when I was early in my ministry, probably in my mid to late 20s. And I went to this nursing home and did not know this individual from anyone else inside of there. I knew one person in there. I went in to go visit them. While I'm walking down this hallway, I was not dressed as you would think a typical preacher with your Bible in your hand and and your suit and all. I was just going dressed in my street clothes to stop in to visit someone. While I was there, there was an elderly person in a wheelchair that was sitting in the hallway. And to this very day, I will never forget this encounter. That person, when I turned the corner of the hallway to walk down that hall, that person started screaming the following, Man of God, get away from me. Man of God, get away from me. The closer I got to that person to cross by them, to get to the room, that person continued to scream those words, Man of God, get away from me. Well, I will be perfectly honest with you, as a young pastor, that bothered me. It bothered me now, even being a little bit older than I was at the time. But the thing is, is that the closer I got to that individual, the spirit that was inside of them was having conflict with the spirit that was inside of me, and that individual was screaming and hollering that. While I was in the room visiting one of my parishioners and asked them, well, who is that person out there? They're screaming and hollering. They said, well, I heard that. But they normally just sit there and nothing. They just sit there in a trance, don't say anything. They just sit there. They said it's very unusual to hear them even hollering or even speaking. So the nurse comes in and I said, is there anything wrong with that person out there? They said, no, we just have to assist them in eating and going to the restroom and changing the clothes. Normally they just sit in the hallway all day long. Why do you ask? I said, well, I was just wondering. So when I got done praying and leaving the room, when I walked out of the room, Their back was to me. When I walk out of the room, guess what happens? The same statement that was being said when I walked towards them, the moment I walked out of the room into the hallway, their back was me. They did not know in the physical that I was there. But the moment I walked in the hallway, they started screaming again, Man of God, get away from me! Man of God, get away from me! When I walked by them and looked them in the face, I said to them, I said, be quiet. And the person went quiet. And the reason why I said be quiet is because what was happening is that that demonic force was making a mockery of that individual. You say, well, pastor, why didn't you say I rebuke you, Satan? Come out of that person. Because I also know this, that when the demonic spirit leaves an individual, the Bible says that it leaves and it goes looking for someone to dwell in. Well, I knew it couldn't dwell in me. But I will tell you this, I didn't want to sit there and play games with it either. You might say, well, Pastor, I would have said, come out of that person, devil. 
you be very careful when you're trying to do spiritual battle. If you're doing it on your own and you walk in there like John Wayne of the Bible, folks, you're going to have some problems. The reason why I tell this to you is not because to say that, oh, look what happened to me. That's happened one or two times in my ministry. It's to say this, be aware there is demonic spirits out there. You see, the demons, it says in 1 Peter 5 eight are deceivers. In Matthew 10, 1, it says that they are evil spirits that can dwell. And in Mark 1, 27, it says they are unclean spirits. But one thing's amazing if you've been in our Bible study, and when we studied 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1, it says that these demons actually spread false doctrine. False doctrine. One thing that was sad during Bible school this past week that really bothered me, a child come up to me and said, I want to be baptized, but I have to wait. I said, well, you have to wait to be saved, right? He said, oh, I'm saved. I'm saved and I'm sanctified, but I can't get baptized. They won't let me get baptized until I'm filled with the Holy Spirit. And I look at the child, and the child's probably 11, 12 years old, and I look at the child and I say, so you're waiting to be filled with the Holy Spirit? And the child said, yes, I was told that's the only time I can be baptized when I have the Holy Spirit. And I said to the child, I said, well, you know that when you're saved, God doesn't just save you and leave you uh, with nothing. He saves you and you have the dwelling of the Holy Spirit. But see, what they had been taught is that the only way they could affirm they had the Holy Spirit was to do what? Speak in tongues or speak in a different language. So this child is having to wait to speak in a different language before they can be baptized. I can guarantee you that the denomination that is teaching that to them cannot even read the Hebrew and the Greek that says that the language that was spoken was languages. It was the language. If you were speaking Spanish or Hebrew or German or English, it was language. It wasn't jibber-jabber. Trust me, God is not glorified on Babel. He is not. And so this is the idea, is that false doctrine. And so what happens is this person is going through a struggle wanting to be baptized, but they're being taught something false. How does this happen? I'm glad you asked. Did you know uh, then the Islam faith that Muhammad, you've heard of Muhammad, right? That Muhammad as a child says that he was encountered by two angels who opened up his chest as a child and poured snow inside his chest. That just throws me for a loop. That somebody would believe that two angels opened up his chest and dumped snow in it. When they asked Muhammad, why did this happen? He says, because it was cleansing me, purifying me. I'll let you know this. If he was encountered by two angels that opened up his chest and dumped something in it, it wasn't angels of God. This was demonic forces that influenced him and Islam is a demonic religion. It is. You don't have to say amen, but I will tell you this. Islam is demonic. And here it says that, it, that two angels did this. Then at the age of 40, Muhammad says he was visited by the angel Gabriel and that the angel Gabriel stuck by him and instructed him for 23 years of how he should write the religious writings that the Muslims follow today. Let me let you know this. The angel Gabriel did not visit Muhammad and tell him how to write Holy Scripture. This was demonic forces that influenced him and now influences the terrorists and others that act on the behalf of Islam. At the age of 50, Muhammad says the angel Gabriel took him up to heaven to meet God. And while he was meeting God, he met Jesus, who he realized was nothing more than a prophet like Moses. Let me say this to you. If the angel Gabriel took Muhammad to heaven and he met Jesus, he'd have known Jesus was more than a prophet. He'd have known more than he was a prince. He'd have known more than he was just a good teacher. He would have known that Jesus was the Son of God. And so when Muhammad said at 50 he went to heaven and met Jesus who was a good teacher, then I will say this to him. You were influenced by a demon who showed you something that was not true. Now, what about the Jehovah Witnesses? 
When Jehovah's Witnesses come and knock on your door, they're going to share with you about an angel. But understand the angel that Jehovah's Witnesses talk about is a spiritual battle because they say that Jesus... Ask the Jehovah's Witness, what is your view on Jesus? And they're going to say Jesus was Michael the archangel in the flesh. Well, my friends, that is a lie from hell. Jesus is the Son of God. He is not an angel. Jesus is higher than the angels. The angels fall down and worship Jesus. They don't fall down and worship a fellow angel. And so Jehovah Witnesses are wrong on so many areas. But when it comes to angelology or demonic forces, they are claiming Jesus is Michael. In doing so, it's not a Jesus we worship. What about Mormons? What about Joseph Smith? On September 21st, 1823, the angel Moroni... Now think about this. The angel Moroni, the Jehovah Witness say, visited Joseph Smith and they give him a special pair of reading glasses. And they present to him these golden tablets. And the Mormons say that whenever Joseph Smith puts on these special glasses and reads these tablets written in gold in this language that he did not understand, but when he put on the glasses and could read it, that that's how he's writing the Book of Mormon. I will let you know this. Joseph Smith might have been visited by an angel, but it was a demon. And it would have been a demon named Moroni. And my friends, any person that's going to follow that is something similar to the word Moroni, I would say a moron. Because if you think that God's given Joseph Smith, who had multiple wives, who practiced false religion, if you think God's given him a different gospel, the Bible says there is no other gospel. The Book of Mormon is a book of lies. There cannot be another gospel. It is Jesus' word and that is final. So Joseph Smith, when he says that this is given to him, yes, it might have been given to him, but I would attest to you it was given to him because a demonic force, a demon angel, gave it to him. Why? Because look at the millions of people who are misled today by Mormonism. Look at the millions of people misled by Jehovah Witness. Why? Because there's a spiritual battle doing what? It's raging. Now let me give you something a little closer to home. There's this TV preacher by the name of Todd Bentley. And I use that term loosely. The only thing about him, he's TV, but he's more of a, a, a sideshow that would be at a circus. Todd Bentley, if you go look him up, you'll find out he says in 1999 of January that there was an angel that visited him, took him to heaven, showed him a hundred pools of water in heaven that were pouring down, and he told him, these pools of water that are pouring down is healing for my people. He also claims in 2001 that an angel that was about seven to eight foot tall by the name of Emma, a female angel, sprinkled him with gold dust and said, now you will have financial blessings. I'm not doubting an angel visited Tom Bentley. What I doubt is that it was an angel of God. What it was, a demonic force. Because guess what? These TV preachers that preach prosperity and the wealth, and they say the angels come and visit them saying that they should do this, My friends, that's exactly what Satan would want. Why? It's not that money is evil, but whenever you fall in love with money, and who can do that? A demonic force would have you drawn closer to money than you would be drawn closer to the Messiah. Let me give you one final example. Can you believe that in the Baptist world there is a transgender pastor? What is that? It's where a man wants to pretend he's in Halloween all throughout the year and dress up as a woman. God said it's an abomination, it's a sin for a man to wear women's clothes and a woman to be trying to act and dress up as a man. It's just plainly, it's a sin, even doing that. Um, I will say this, I have always been very uncomfortable and I know churches have done it and it's been cute and funny and all uh, I would never do this. I've always been uncomfortable of these brideless weddings that I have heard of and, and I have actually seen where churches put on a skit where the man's dressed up like the woman and the bride and, and doing this or, or womanless beauty pageants. Oh, there's no harm in that, Pastor Ken. Well, you've got to understand 
if you got a woman, then let her just be a woman. If you got a man, let him be a man, right? And you say, well, back in the days, oh, it was just fun and games. Folks, don't you understand that everything starts out all laughs and giggles and chuckles, and then you look back and say, how did we get to this point? Now, I'm not some old fuddy-duddy. I like to have a good time, and I like to cut up. You know that. But I also know that we've got to be careful, don't we? All right, I didn't get any amens, but that's fine. Transgender Baptist pastor by the name of Dylan Robinson. I refuse to call him by his female acquired name. But Dylan Robinson said that an angel spoke to him and confirmed that his transgender homosexual beliefs was correct because the angel said this, Dylan, the Bible is wrong in what it teaches about homosexuality. So in our lifetime, right now, there is a person standing behind a pulpit preaching that homosexuality is biblically sound because the Bible is wrong and the angel that visited this person was right. I do not doubt an angel visited that person, but I will say this to you, I would imagine it was a demon. Why? Reinforcing the lie that that person already believed. You see, we should understand that we are in a holy combat in Revelation 12, 4, 9. And we should understand that we're going to be attacked as Christians, 2 Corinthians 12, 7 and 1 Peter 5, 8. But what we should understand most importantly is at the end of the day, God is victorious. Don't use a cop out and say the devil made me do it. Have you ever said, oh, the devil made them do it? No, they did not make you do anything. You simply followed your own evil lust and desires. When you sin, it is because you have followed your own evil desires and lust. Now, let me wrap it up. I've been very poignant, and, and maybe some of you might think a little too hard on you. So let me end with something sweet and nice. Kind of like when you get the shot at the doctor's office and they give you the lollipop. Here's the lollipop. What's sweet is to know this, is that God loves you so much. He doesn't want you to live in fear of demons. God doesn't want you to live and being paranoid about, oh, you're being watched over. Don't get so focused like back in the 80s and 90s. I can remember it seemed like every Bible study being written was about angels. Don't don't get so focused on the angels and demons that you forget about the Creator. Angels and demons have power, but they're not all powerful. Angels and demons are messengers, but they are not the message. The message is Jesus Christ and it's His Holy Word. Today, if you're not saved, I will say this to you, you have more of a demonic presence in your life than you will ever know. It is important to be saved. And when you're saved, you ask Christ to forgive you of your sins. You confess with your mouth and you believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord and He enters into you. The Holy Spirit enters at that moment. It is not entering to you because you're speaking in tongues. It's entering to you because it is His gift not to leave you as an abandoned child. He loves you. Today, maybe you've taken it all lightly. Maybe you've said, oh, this all angels and demons stuff. Uh, Pastor, uh, you know, we live in the modern time. That's just all a bunch of old wise tales. Uh, What happened to you up at the nursing home that day? That was just something that was mental illness. Uh, uh, Pastor, it really can't be going on. I, I will tell you this. The reason why I don't talk a lot about my experiences of things I have seen and witnessed is because people will think you're just out of this world and crazy. I mean, folks, I tell you, they think I'm crazy enough when I don't talk stuff like that. But how many of you know that there's things that have happened in your life, you're like, something's going on there. And so when you're going through struggles as a believer in Jesus Christ, turn to God. Don't turn to a guardian angel. Turn to God. His Son, Jesus Christ, is the one who hears your prayers and can answer you. God loves you today, and don't ever forget that. Let's pray.